Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the last day of our Global Education Conference here in 2019. Bronwyn Joyce is here with us from Australia, where it's just after 2 a.m. for her. Bronwyn, you're our first keynote of the day. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to quickly introduce Bronwyn. She is an educator from Australia who specializes in curriculum innovation and the delivery of professional development linked to critical and creative thinking and bringing the world into classrooms. She uses the connection of social media to mentor and globalize teachers in classrooms internationally. Bronwyn has traveled the world speaking about the importance of preparing students to be future ready. She's also an advocate for the United Nations Sustainable Goals. She will host the first ever OGC Global Summit for Future Ready Education in Australia in July 2020. She believes that we live in a world where we should be learning together. Her Our Global Classroom mission statement is simple. One world, one classroom. Okay, Bronwyn, I'm going to turn the time over to you. Thanks, Dave. Okay, hi everyone, and welcome to um, the next 50 minutes or so. Um, hopefully I can enrich you with some uh, learning around uh, my passion, and that is uh, globalising classrooms. And as I um, go through some different resources today, I'm going to um, really hone in on, on the fact that Collaboration and connections are vital, yes, um, to globalise classrooms, but I think if we take that step back, it's about building background knowledge and excitement within our classrooms as well before we even take that step to initiate project work and um, collaborations and connections. And so something that um, I'm really passionate about is the work that actually happens in the, in the classroom itself. And at the moment around the world, teachers are experiencing um, interesting times where um, there is a lot of fatigue and tiredness. There's high expectations coming from the top down on data and the um, expectations that um, testing is still so important uh, over the individual student and their, their learning styles. And so um, just, just to begin a little bit um, of my journey, um, as Steve said in the beginning, I've been very blessed over the last eight years to uh, take myself um, to many countries around the world uh, to seek out um, knowledge about what's happening in classrooms and how we can um, be enriching the learning for our students. That journey began for me um, from a trip into China where um, I was asked to uh, initiate global projects. And very interesting enough, um, I'm, you know, I'm here live online and probably eight years ago, um, I couldn't even barely um, do anything on the computer. I was still handwriting lots in my classroom, um, didn't know how to use um, anything like Skype or to connect um, into classrooms. So here I was sent to China to um, initiate a global project. And so through that learning circle, um, it came back into my classroom and, and I came to the realisation that um, the students in my classroom weren't reading newspapers, they didn't know what was happening out in the world and so um, here I was uh, about to bombard them with this project on, on China and most of them didn't even know where China was. They'd heard of the place. Um, so that took me on um, a parallel almost journey there on, okay, well, how can I then um, enrich the learning in my classroom to integrate it into the curriculum that I'm expected to teach, not add it, cause it as an add-on to what I was doing, but use it to uh, push the thought process and deepen the thinking of the students that I was teaching. So hence, um, over the, the work that I um, 
took on in the early days, teaching myself how to use a computer. Um, then uh, learning how to use Twitter was a huge when I was in Qatar in the Middle East. The whole conference I went to was ran off Twitter. And so can you imagine I'm sitting there in this huge conference hall and I didn't even know what Twitter was. And so very quickly within a day, I was had learned how to use Twitter and, um, you know, my life changed dramatically because I think my biggest PLN and um, almost, I would say, more a, a family has generated from um, the Our Global Classroom community that I've been able to develop through uh, Twitter. So um, the next step that I wanted to, to take was to then test these projects. And so um, you can have as many researchers um, on this planet and you can read as many books as, as you want to develop yourself, but it's when you get in there, as we know, and you practice things in your classroom is where the learning begins, even as an educator. And so hence, um, as much as I would have loved to take my work out and, and travel the world, I've spent the last seven years um, actually testing um, and working with the students in my classroom, innovating the curriculum that I have to teach and broadening the knowledge um, of the students as well. And so um, I said to my students many years ago, I said, okay, we need a new, we need a new name for our classroom because now, you know, we're learning about all this global work and um, we need a name. And, and the kids said to me, well, it's our classroom and we're global. So let's call ourselves our global classroom. And so hence the our global classroom journey uh, began. And from there, um, each year, each grade I've had over the last seven years, at the, at the first thing I say to them when they arrive in my classroom on the first day of school is I say, welcome to um, the Our Global Classroom family. Uh, you are now no longer 5-6-J. You are um, going to be part of the most inspirational journey of your life over the next 12 months as you actually take steps to, uh, to learn about the world, uh, bring the world into our classroom, but also for them to initiate their own lead in projects when collaborating um, with around themselves around the world. And so what I've actually seen is um, I've had students in my class mentored by uh, international teachers uh, through technology tools. Uh, I've had experts from around the world Skyping into to my classroom with my students. Um, and we've participated in uh, many different um, projects. Uh, currently, we've got two different ones going. Uh, we've just finished um, one and we're moving into uh, two uh, holiday projects as, as we speak. So um, what I did is I said to the, the students, uh, our global classroom is like a business for me. I uh, reach out to educators around the world. So you're actually in charge of this business because you are the people that are going to create the greatness uh, and you are the ones that are going to produce the understanding and the work that's going to lead other children around the world. And every year I, I say goodbye to a, a new group of students who have just um, inspired me um, as an educator from the work that they've produced uh, thanks to the fact that we are a global classroom. So um, as, I, as I said, um, you know, I have a philosophy on our global classroom and Steve spoke about that um, when we began. And, you know, really uh, what we're looking at is us educators and, and teachers, we are, we are the, the future of, of these, these children because education does depict the success of many children's futures on where they're going to head to. Um, you know, and so uh, allows, by bringing the world into, into our classrooms, we start developing uh, children who are global citizens, uh, we build empathy for others, 
And then we also prepare them for the future. And I think that is what is so important. And what we need to realise is that the students we're now teaching in 10 years time will be working in jobs that haven't been invented at the moment. So how do we prepare them? We need to prepare them to be critical thinkers. We need to prepare them to problem solve, to be independent. And what I'm seeing at the moment in so many schools around the world is us taking that step back a little bit and going back into that um, top down and, and data being so important. And then we've got to group the children into, and groups are great, don't get me wrong, but group them into um, streamlining situations. Well, how does the, the kid that is creative learn from the academic kid if they're always in separate groups? So um, I'm really, really passionate about the independence that brings um, we need to bring into to classrooms. And I think the biggest um, eye-opener for me is that um, we're seeing children who have no knowledge about the world. And if we don't bring that world to them, they may never, ever know there's a world out there for them to explore. They're never going to break poverty cycles. They're never going to achieve the dreams that they want to. We have to expose them to those things. We have to instill values in them that they can follow their dreams. And, and I think that's um, where, for me, the whole Our Global Classroom concept comes from because it's about us all needing to learn together as uh, one big classroom. Um, because we do live in, in one big world and a lot of times there is some scary stuff going on out there in our world and we need to give kids a voice about how they feel about it and we also need to listen to them on what the solutions could be because they are the ones that are going to take us, as we say with the UN goals, into 2030. So for me, if we... Um, Move into the, the classroom situation, um, curriculum innovation is um, very, very important. And I think that's an area where teachers at the moment are feeling like, um, you know, I've got this heavy loaded curriculum and I, I can't change it. I've got to teach everything. And even, and I know in, in many countries, we've got subject-based teachers. It's no different for them as well. You know, here's the textbook, you've got to teach it, get it done. Well, um, the thing is, uh, te textbooks aren't the be all and end all, and we can innovate them if we have to. It's about teachers thinking outside the box and taking risks. And I know that's really, really hard when we have administrators breathing down our necks saying, if you don't do a good job, your job might be on the line, or you might not get um, your next pay rise. Um, but I think that if you do it within the parameters of the actual uh, subjects you're teaching, you're not doing anything that is against what the curriculum is telling you. And I think that we need to be moving with uh, what's happening in our world and in the future, and that means that we have to be shifting our thinking as educators in our, in our classrooms as well. And so a big step... Um, that I believe about globalising classroom comes with critical and creative thinking. And we just need to um, look here. This is um, a quote from the Australian Curriculum document. And um, I've just finished running the professional development for the Australian Curriculum um, Association on, on this topic of critical and creative thinking, as well as intercultural understanding and ethical understandings. And I think if we look here, it, it tells us exactly what should be happening in our classrooms. We need to be having students who are um, deeply using skills and behaviours such as reason, logic, resourcefulness, we, they need to know where to access things. Um, imagination, creativity um, and innovation, taking something and changing it. And, you know, this can be done in all learning areas and, and I love what it finishes off with and in their lives beyond school. And that's what we want. We want kids to, to take it from the classroom into the community, into their homes into um, uh, the local projects and being involved in what's happening. 
And so um, if we, we look at it within a, in the Australian curriculum, uh, these actual topics such as critical and creative thinking come under what we call the general capabilities. And that's where we see um, it doesn't have a heading that says maths or science or literacy. And so teachers push these things aside thinking that, um, look, that's, that, I don't have time to fit that in. I've got to do the core subject areas. But in fact, this work just moulds into those core subject areas. And if we look at it, reflective, um, reflecting on thinking and, and processes, you know, every lesson we should be having kids reflect on um, their learning and what's been happening um, throughout the, the sessions that they're, they're doing. Um, you know, in the inquiry process, we should have kids asking questions, doesn't matter what we're teaching and, and how we're, we're teaching it. And that uh, we look at Bloom's taxonomy and some uh, thinking skill areas like that, and they level it up with the analysing and the synthesising. And then, you know, we want kids to be metacognitive where they're thinking about their own thinking. And so uh, this can all happen you know, I, I'm here just relaying this through my head from uh, the point of view of a literacy lesson at the moment, and then I'm flipping it to a science science lesson. So um, these things can be definitely intertwined into what's happening within our curriculums. And so if there's anything that um, I can get everybody to take away from today, and that is um, the notion that all kids can think. And what we're seeing in classrooms at the moment is we're seeing teachers still struggling to release the responsibility over to their students and they are taking the thinking opportunities away. And they're doing that by uh, the teacher doing all the talking. I don't know how many times um, we've all walked into a classroom and we've seen uh, kids sitting there on the floor and they've been there for 30 minutes uh, in the classroom that I teach, if I go beyond 10 minutes, I start seeing kids rolling around on the floor. I've lost their, their um, attention span. You know, we need to be short and sharp, straight in with our, um, with our explicit teaching, and then we want kids doing. We want kids um, active and, and doing things in our, in our classrooms. And um, when we have kids in our classrooms that have auditory processing disorders, um, sitting on different levels of the spectrum who have mental health issues like ADHD. If we're going to sit them on the floor for 30 minutes and do all the talking, we're definitely going to lose all the thought process. And so we don't want that. We want to have kids curious about what's happening in their classroom. And I love um, the quote there, the more kids see that their thinking matters, the more they understand their own power. And, and so we, we see that and, and I'll be able to show you some examples of that as we um, go through. So I just wanted to quickly um, touch on um, for a, a huge part of uh, what I've uh, found within the classroom learning circle is that um, thinking critically and creatively really blends well in with uh, project-based learning. Uh, we like to call it here in Australia um, inquiry-based uh, learning in the inquiry model. Um, now, Kath Murdoch uh, is an Australian educator and she is um, an ex absolute expert uh, in this work. And if there's any resource that you need in your library is Kath's book, The Power of Inquiry. Um, it outlines everything uh, that globalising classrooms are about and uh, digging deep into those topics that we should have kids exploring. And so um, she lays out the whole process, as we can see in the diagram there, the tuning in, the finding out, the sorting out, um, you know, taking things further. Um, but what I love the most is that word taking action. And when we have kids inquiring in our classrooms, we want them to take action. We want them to develop questions that they have to seek answers for and we want those questions to be open-ended and be able to be applied and action 
uh, actions taken, whether it be within your local school, whether in the community or whether it be lo uh, globally. And this year um, I'm teaching uh, fifth and sixth grade uh, combined uh, composite class. And I've seen um, it through our inquiry process this year, we spent six months working on uh, immigration, Australian immigration. And what that took us uh, to was um, not just immigration, but it took us back to early Australia. So we started studying history within this. It then took us into looking at um, the big issues on refugees and um, the immigration crisis that um, different countries are, are having. Um, it saw uh, students having to take um, action uh, after developing uh, some really deep thinking questions. And if I can think of a couple, um, we had one student uh, develop a website because she believed that refugees and, and immigrants um, to Australia uh, were being uh, robbed of a voice. They didn't have a voice to, to tell their stories. And so she built a website where um, she was calling for um, refugees to contact her uh, with their stories and so that they could share share their stories now this is she was a fifth grader and um, that was really important she researched um, different refugee stories from around the world um, and immigrant stories um, so and that was all done independently through this cycle um, so she then went on to um, we had, so we saw other students who uh, thought that the detention centre situation we had here in Australia um, at this point they wouldn't be able to change it but maybe they could um, be able to give the detention centres um, an up upgrade almost and so we had these kids becoming interior designers and they were redesigning what a detention centre looked like renaming it. Um, so yes, there had to be somewhere for illegal immigrants to go, but how could they make that a situation that was going to be much more receptive and comfortable for, for people uh, during those situations? And, and it became very powerful in the way that when we uh, researched through the research phase in that um, finding out and sorting out, the students uh, found that Australia was actually um, in the top five countries for um, uh, the United Nations uh, were not overly happy with our, the way we were running our um, immigration um, policies and, and with the government. So next thing we saw another group of children decided that Australia needed a referendum on the refugee crisis out here. And so within this inquiry cycle, we're seeing kids taking hold of their, their own learning. Now, this can be done um, through uh, literacy and English teachers can be running this. This can be um, ran through history. So uh, the list is endless of the different subjects that this, this cycle could actually go through. So um, now uh, Kat's book is, is, I think it's like 50, 50 Australian dollars. So um, it, it's a really cheap buy and well worth it's it's like my uh, go-to bible um I, I carry it every everywhere with me so um and it leads a lot of what goes on on in my classroom so and so then um we move to to the next phase of um what i want to talk about and and again it's still around that prompting critical and creative thinking and um Interesting enough, Dave Perkins um, in The Age, which is a, a huge national newspaper out here in Australia, way back in 2005, um, told us that um, it was, there was one simple problem with thinking and that's that it was invisible. And so um, we needed to start making thinking visible so that it didn't sound as hard as what it, what it is. And, and we go back to that quote, every child can think. Um, and so hence, um, I started to, after going to a professional development session with um, a, a really knowledgeable man named uh, Tom March, uh, I thought I was going to learn to be 
uh, how to blog. And next thing, um, he was talking to us about this look to learn process. And uh, it really changed the way that I um, brought the world into my classroom, but also the way that I could see what kids were actually thinking. And it actually made their thinking visual. And whether it was one sentence or a paragraph, the power of um, this work was um, amazing. And he shared um, with us uh, different uh, starters, uh, starting points that um, now over the years I've built my own and, and developed my, my own a, as I go through. And, but, you know, he, he looked at it, that concept of the importance of asking questions. And so uh, we look here at, around those two big questions, what's going on and what do you see that makes you say that? So we're asking kids to actually have a look, form an opinion and, and tell us what they're actually thinking about it. And so hence led to... Um, Tom shared with us all these amazing thinking stems. And so um, as, I, as I go on um, in a moment, just to show you some examples, um, all I do is I take uh, amazing images from around the world, what, whether it be from newspapers, whether it be um, just from online resources. I take these inspirational images and I put these um, actual stems to them and uh, you'll see um, there's many books uh, there's um, making thinking visual books and and lots of them but you can read and read and read all it's taken me is to use these stems and um, already I, I have counted around 189 but I'm pretty sure there's well in excess of over 200 um, of these global lessons that I have um, integrated into my um, literacy program that I run um, with my class. And sometimes we even do these as um, standalone tasks. Uh, it's taught the kids not only um, uh, to think deeply, we also, I create, uh, typing on a blog or commenting on a blog is actually classed as a genre in my classroom. And so responding to these on a classroom blog um, gives me also assessment for, for students' writing. So all of this work I'm talking about is all assessment that you can be using on, on how kids are thinking and um, where they're at. And you'll be surprised. Um, to see that the kids that can't do the worksheet that are handed in many classrooms, but you give them this work and they open a whole new um, look at their actual learning ability and what they can actually um, do. And in fact, we're doing them a disservice by um, handing them these worksheets that are either too hard, too easy, or not even relevant to to the learning that they need to be to be doing. So, um, which leads me to um, this man, Joel uh, Bergner, and um, I stumbled across, uh, I have a little bit of a, an, an interest, and I shouldn't say a little bit, because I'm really um, quite interested in murals and the messages that come out of murals. And so I stumbled upon Joel's work and, um, Apply these to those thinking stems. Now, I would encourage everybody to, to get onto Joel's website and take a look because Joel is um, a freelance artist who travels the world uh, creating these murals and he is, um, he's originally from the US and he doesn't do them in just any place. He is in the favelas of Brazil. He's in the refugee camps in Jordan. Uh, he's in the slums of India. He's in the Bronx in um, the US. So every mural has a message. And I think um, for me, uh, the most inspirational work Joel did was where he took um, a group of um, Palestinians and um, Israelis 
and um, he, he brought them together. And um, the work he does is uh, really powerful. And I know when I bring this into my classroom, you know, this could be um, in an art, you could use his work in an art class. Um, you could use his this work in your um, literacy. We use it for reading and I use it for reading and writing um, classes. Um, and again, you could also open it up to, to so many other opportunities. So um, by taking a look at his website, um, you will see here's just a few of um, few pictures here of his work. Um, there is one that um, captivated um, me and brought me to tears and he had worked with a 14 year old girl in the US um, who had uh, he worked with a team of children uh, with mental health concerns. And he painted the most amazing mural of this young girl and she's holding an umbrella. Um, and uh, I think it was around about a week later after he'd finished the mural, she'd actually taken her own life. And so um, the stories that are behind this work of his, um, you know, bringing that into your classroom, it doesn't matter who... Um, the child is, whether they're from a low socioeconomic background or whether they're from um, a, a, an affluent family, all kids think the world revolves around them. And when you start uh, showing them about other situations in the world, now obviously in a junior classroom, I wouldn't talk about the girl with the umbrella, but in a secondary school classroom, um, definitely mental health and um, is, is a topic that needs to be discussed. And so um, he, he, he initiates, his work initiates conversations and that's what I think we should be bringing into, into our classrooms. And here's just an example of a piece of artwork um, of Joel's and how I applied um, one of those thinking stems to um, to his work and it was just a, a no want to know and, and learned um, you know but it was about them having to explore his work um, wanting to know what more do you, do you want to know about it and then um, you know and, and what new things that um, they could could also get and and the big thing at the end and I think um, inferential thinking is something that a lot of our kids struggle to do whether it is a, as readers um, or whether it just be um, as thinkers. And so I always like to put inference in there somewhere where they have to think beyond and actually think uh, about what's next, what, what, what would become of, of this image, what or the community or, or where it's come from. So, um, so there's just an example. Uh, there's just the link to um, my current blog at the moment. As I said, I think... I've put there 186, but um, I think now, as I continue through the year, there would be well in excess of 200 different look to learns. That why reinvent the wheel? Jump on there and have a look, and definitely you'll find uh, lots and lots of resources that um, can support. Um, you can see some of the images down the bottom there that I that I use. Um, you know. It's open to, to whatever whatever imagery you want to use or video, digital, digital media. Um, videos and YouTube clips are, are really, really um, popular as well um, now. So here's just two more examples of um, these are, uh, one is from the Our Global Classroom um, Flipgrid, which I'll quickly touch on in a moment. But here are, are lessons that I would run as standalone lessons in my classroom. Um, the, the man with the children in the, in the bath, uh, it just is, uh, it's my screensaver. It, to me, it is the most dynamic and most beautiful picture um, we could ever see. And, and why is it that, um, you know, a father bathing his children is any different than one of us bathing our children to him spending that that time? Time with his children and, and that's what um, as you can can see the questions that I've put to, to the students in the classroom you know what if that was your family you know um, 
why is the picture so peaceful to look at? So, you know, getting them to think beyond, um, beyond that, that picture. And uh, the reason I've put the unbelievable journey of a refugee up there is um, because I would, you all need to go away and listen to um, Missy Higgins, uh, uh, her song, O Canada, um, because if there's any lesson that I've taught in my classroom in the 17 years that I've been teaching was when I do this lesson, um, and I've only taught it in the last three years, and um, I've taught it with grade three fours and grade five sixes, and I've been, I've had uh, students brought to tears, not from the video, from the work that they've done. I've, I've been brought to tears. The thinking that it initiates um, within the, the classroom is um, beyond anything you could imagine. We, I had students making videos from uh, this film clip. Um, this is on the What If, if grid with the video on there, so you, you can go to that. Um, but I can tell you that um, the video clip and the song uh, will change your whole perspective of um, bringing the world into your classroom and for kids to be thinking about other kids and that empathy for, for others. It's, um, it's, it's, very, it's very deep. So, so then we link to, you know, we talk about um, this work that we're doing within our classroom. How do we branch that out? Uh, beyond the classroom. And so um, I've been very lucky to work with some amazing um, educators uh, through Flipgrid and in particular um, Michael Dresick and Melinda Hertz who have um, followed, um, followed me and supported me um, through a lot of the work that I do. But uh, they have been uh, the most amazing um, colleagues for me, as we developed um, a grid that we could get this type of critical thinking out there for kids to be to be thinking of, and Flipgrid um, has been an amazing tool for us to connect with classrooms around the world. And so, um, it started with uh, just what if? What if um, you know? What if uh, the snake versus the iguana? I'm just looking at the pictures below, um, kicking in the time of the morning that it is here at the moment as well. Um, but the what if grid enables teachers to innovate the curriculum. I've actually already done it for them. And uh, Michael and Melinda are the same. They've put, they've got tasks up there as well. Um, there's nothing you have to do. The lessons are there for you. And some of the lessons are actually some of the, um, there's a couple on there that are uh, the most used lessons um, for Flipgrid as well. So there's one in particular, the refugee backpack that I'll show you in a moment. Um, but again, we're globalising the classroom. We, we're starting within the classroom setting. These are lessons that have to be ran within the classroom. Um, and then you connect or you collaborate based on whether it's a project. Um, we have ran projects um, and campaigns through the grid uh, or whether it's just that connection where you can be watching other, other students uh, work. So what's so powerful about the What If grid? Well, um, every single topic, we make sure that it's linked to the United Nations Sustainable Goals in some way and real um, real world issues and the big issues of the world. Um, the topics are diverse um, and they link to all curriculum areas. Um, all lessons are linked to critical and creative thinking, so they're going to, going to have kids thinking outside the box. The topics are multifaceted, so teachers, teachers could take a topic and then they could sequence them over a week. And I do that quite often. I'll, I'll choose a topic and um, I'll unpack it. We'll do part of it. We'll do some more the next day. And then we'll get to the videoing at the end. Um, the most powerful thing is that uh, the, the students thinking 
actually then is presented to a global audience because this grid is global. Um, it now has almost 25,000 student uh, responses and there has been around 325,000 um, educators that have uh, connected and linked in to educators and students that have linked into this this grid um, and as much as um, we all get busy again um, we're revamping and putting new new lessons up all the all the time and here's just some examples of some of the lessons that you'll find on there um, as we said uh, big topics you know feeling self-doubt um, but what I what I do and what the team do is is we use real world um, real world digital media and imagery to be able to have students connect with what we're what we're asking. Um, you are a teacher for the day. Um, global goal um, four, which is talking about quality education. So we get kids, um, you know, really thinking about that. Um, zero hunger versus zero child labour. We we want um, we want kids to be accessing food wherever they are in in the world, and um, we also have to bring to our students' attention that there are kids who are actually forced into child labour. Um, extreme poverty, uh, walking for water. Um, what's in your suitcase? And I'll have that a little bit. Um, further on what if you're a famous singer you know we look at the lyrics of songs are so powerful um, in changing uh, the world and and on the weekend here I went to a festival and I've had a, a musician here in Australia write the anthem for the global summit next year and the power of the words in the lyrics and so what if you know we Put that topic to the kids. What if you were a famous singer? What messages could you get out there? So, um, okay, here's here's the famous what's in your suitcase. Um, all we give them is a, around a minute, I think it's a minute 30, the, the video. Um, but then we ask them the big question of what if you had to escape from your home tomorrow? You do not know whether you will return Remember, you can only have one suitcase and you're probably going to leave the country on foot or by road. You might not always be sleeping in a house at night and you have five to ten minutes to decide what to take. And when you see... I, I With the younger students, you have to do it with a comparison. So when I teach younger students this lesson, I say, all right, if we were going on a holiday, what would we take? Okay. Now we have to leave our house really quickly. Now, um, people say to me sometimes, well, isn't that a little bit um, controversial sometimes? And, I, you know, we, I teach um, in a school where some students um, are in poverty and they may be um, taken from, from their home. Again, we're bringing that, we're bringing the situations to light that there is other people or children experiencing these experiences as well. And so um, I always put it into context with what I'm doing within my, within my classroom. So um, yes, sometimes you have to be careful and you have to be sensitive to, to what students you have in your classroom. But I think um, the content and, and how you, you present that to your class and going from the refugee angle um, is really, really powerful. Um, another one is um, Home in Zatari Refugee Camp and um, uh, another resource that I um, reach out to you all to trial in classrooms is Zatari 360 where you can virtually take your students into Camp Zatari in Jordan, a refugee camp. And there'll be days where my kids will say, can we just have half an hour? We want to go to Camp Zatari. And they'll get their headphones out and their, their laptops and they'll sit down and they'll just explore Camp Zatari. We've done um, many writing pieces um, thanks to that technology tool and um, some really powerful um, thinking around just not just the life in a refugee camp, but, you know, what makes up a refugee camp. We look at the infrastructure of it. Um, 
you know, so how close is it to the borders? Um, so we're starting to bring in geography. We're bringing in um, technology and design. So, you know, there's so many different different areas we can be um, looking at there. Uh, the new grid that is unfolding at the moment is the What If Science grid. Um, and uh, I have discovered the most amazing, amazing YouTube um, channel, the What If uh, YouTube channel. And it has, uh, let's just say, every day in my classroom, the kids watch a What If. They go for about three minutes and we finish our day every day watching one of the, the what if um, videos on YouTube. And um, so I'm molding them into lessons for the classrooms at the moment, very similar to the, the what if um, grid that we have, the global grid. Um, and this one is around um, these a science and STEM based um, thinking for students. So um, that is um, you know what if science is the is the grid code um, with no space and um, there's already ten topics on there that teachers can explore and um, you'll love it you know what if our world was without plastic um, everyone in the world went vegan you know what if um, Africa broke away from the rest of the world and I think um, one of my favorite favorite ones was we did a big we um, my class was part of the global goal project and we were given global goal seven which was around um, a clean energy and so the Sahara Desert and solar panels um, watch it very interesting how we could be um, actually generating um, clean energy for the world. So there's some really great thinking there as well. So I want to um, just, I need to probably check the, the time. Oh, yep, I've got about three minutes. So I'm going to quickly just um, finish off here. Um, and that is with um, the writer's notebook. And this is something that I'm quickly, I'll quickly show you all. Um, but here's where you can see the actual work generated from. I'll show you the work generated from what the kids are doing with their thinking. So here's one of the students' pages. Um, the writer's notebook is, there's no rules in the notebook. And we actually, we've transformed it into our grade. And we now call it the global notebook because everything we seem to do in our classroom is linked something globally. Um, and um, it just opens up a whole new world for kids because it's where they can get all their, their thinking down. And, um, and I love that quote at the bottom, writing in, in a notebook is a way to fuel up supreme, superior, unlettered, and it's free. So um, here is... Um, uh, one of the students in my class, you can see um, she's holding her refugee page. Here's the way she's expressed her thinking there. She's done some thinking on um, human rights. Um, here's some um, other work from, from students uh, there as, as well. Um, and, you know, you can see over there, I think they're uh, exited instead of excited. But, hey... It's about their thinking. If I want them to draft it up, then they have to start thinking about their spelling and that. This book is just about kids getting everything down. And um, in the top corner, you can see um, the, the refugee one, um, which was based from the lyrics, lyrics from O Canada. So, um, so I just want to finish off with encouraging everybody to... Um, take their, you know, to take learning beyond the walls in, in your classrooms. Don't be scared. Um, as you're seeing today, I, I've produced lots of things that you can um, definitely uh, do to uh, globalise your classroom without having to participate in global projects and things like that. If you want to just start small and in your classroom. Um, and uh, you can find me on, on Twitter. Um, yes, when I registered my name, I didn't think that it, it creates a Twitter handle for you many, many years ago, and hence my first name is last. So my name is not Joyce, it's actually Bromwen, but it's backwards on, on Twitter. And um, my new Education Elevators website is all up and, up and running now, so 
Um, I tempt you all to, to get on there and, and have a look as, as well as the work that, that I'll be doing doing with this next year when I'm out of the classroom and hopefully travelling around teaching educators about how to do this, this great work. So um, thank you to Lucy and Steve for, for having me. Um, it's been an absolute um, pleasure and I hope that everybody can, um, yeah, got something something out of it today. Thanks, Bronwyn. And just as a reminder, folks, it's almost 3 a.m. where she is. This is a superhuman effort. We appreciate it. Yep. No, I'll go, to, I'll go have some sleep now and turn up tomorrow morning ready to teach again. <laughs> You're a hero. One quick, one quick thing. I'm going to give you some feedback, unfortunately. Tell us about your conference. Oh, my conference. So um, the conference next year will run from the 4th, to, uh, sorry, the 5th to the 10th of July in my hometown here in Trelgan. Um, and so uh, what we're actually going to be doing is I'm bringing some of the, um, some really innovative and great educators from around the world are making the trip in. We've got a UN delegate, um, we've got an innovative curriculum innovator coming in from Dubai. Uh, we've got uh, my Our Global Classroom team. Hopefully lots of them are coming out from the US and from Q8. And what we're doing is um, we're integrating four things over that week. We're running an entrepreneurial boot camp for youth over the week. We're running a conference where there'll be amazing keynotes and we've already got uh, already 50 uh, workshop sessions um, set up and more coming in every day. Um, we also have um, a UN delegate, uh, Dr. Ariel King, coming in from Geneva and she's going to be running some youth summits um, with uh, the students as, as well over the week. And we're also throwing in a global, um, sorry, a cultural day in there where we're going to allow, shut down the conference for a day and send um, all the participants out to explore our local, my local area here. So um, it's going to be a conference with a difference. It's all about community and it's all about grassroots teachers and it's super cheap. Um, we're offering it, uh, the price for a ticket is only 450 Australian dollars. So I think with the dollar at the moment so down, I think for US, uh, in US dollars, it's only around 280 or so, 300 Australian uh, US dollars to come. Yes, you have to get here, but, um, and because it's not in a capital city, which was really important to me, um, it makes accommodation and things like that a half the price so um yeah um so yeah it, it's going to be a great week it's going to be exhausting but if you can make it um yeah it, it's going to be um phenomenal so um if i've not got any sleep now it's going to be lacking a lot of sleep leading up to that event i can tell you Okay, we're going to close up. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Brown One. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Lucy. Take care. <laughs>